So this is an exciting time for the field of us building quantum hardware. There's a lot of different approaches, a lot of exciting things going on. And uh, in fact, I'll talk a little bit about some experiments we're trying to do to show the power of a quantum computing in a relatively short time period. My talk here is not so much a review of the digital hardware, but for the technologists or business leaders here, I want to give you enough technical detail and explanation technical detail so you can tell how the hardware efforts are improving over time how we're on track, what do we need to do. I really want the users to know enough about hardware to figure out where we're going and what's the chance of all of this working, uh, working well. Um, so uh, uh, right now, it's a really interesting time. People have said we're in the quantum space race with a lot of uh, uh, government organizations, big companies, startup companies, getting involved trying to make these very complex quantum systems. And there's lots of challenges here. But I would say if you look at the press releases, and I would say 99% of the time you go to a talk, a technical talk like here, you're going to hear this space race, this, this quantum race described in terms of number of qubits. And that's fair. I mean, that's something we're trying to do now. But the number one thing I want you to come away with today is it's more than just quantity, okay? It's qubit quality. And I'm going to say, Houston, we have a problem because its quality is not talked about enough. And I'm going to show you in the talk why quality is fundamentally important for qubits. And I might even add it's more important than quantity. Okay, surely you have to do both, and surely we're building complex systems. It's much more than that, too. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, so just analogy with the space race. You need quantity. You need heavy lifting Saturn V rockets to get to the moon. But if you don't guide those rockets well, it's going to crash and blow up and kill all the instruments, so the astronauts. So can we make qubits that don't crash too fast, okay? That's what we're trying to do here. Now, first of all, let me talk about the power of the quantum computing. We're talking about qubits that don't exist right now, that quality is not an issue, they're, they're perfect. But it does illustrate kind of some of the why we're doing this, why quantity is important. Basically, this digital quantum computer is a parallel processing machine where you can try zero and one at the same time, running it through your algorithms. Okay, factor of two for one qubit's great, but what's really important as you add qubits, you double the processing power for each qubit you add. So it's growing exponentially as the number of qubits, and the time you get the 50 or so to the 50 is the size of a big supercomputer, okay? And by the time you get beyond that, 300, it's the absolutely huge numbers. And we're trying to take advantage of this. However, these are perfect qubits. That's not what we have in the lab. So just to give you an understanding of what all that means in terms of building it, I'll go through, briefly describe structurally how a quantum computer works, comparing classical with quantum, okay? Now, when you have a classical bit, okay, you can think of that, say, a coin on a table, or of course these days it would be a cell phone, with, it, with cell phone up as zero and cell phone down as one. But the important thing to remember here is that there's noise and, and things go wrong in the real world. But because you have a restoring force and because I have dissipation, these states are stable as long as there's not you know, huge amounts of noise. So this is, allows us to describe information digitally as zero or one, and it's self-correcting. Okay, it's essentially perfect. Okay, in a quantum bit, it can be zero or one, but we can represent the rotation of this as, let's say, a zero plus one. In fact, there's some phase to it also. Uh, think of it, it's almost like a coin in space. This can be an arbitrary direction here. What this means is that this is an analog system when you're building a quantum bit, 
and you're sensitive to small little forces that gives you errors, and your qubits are fundamentally error-prone, and if you want to talk about it at all sensibly, you have to talk about what the errors are going to do. Like I say, this is, this is fundamental to a real quantum system, okay? So uh, then, of course, what you have to do is build up your system to lots of qubits. And, of course, in the classical system, if you can do an arbitrary logic by having one-bit NOT gates and two-bit AND gates, and I drew a, a diagram here where you have, in this case, an adder, and you lay out your, your little circuit elements in space, okay, to give you kind of the flow of the information through there. In quantum circuit, it's very similar to that. To make an arbitrary quantum circuit, you need one-bit arbitrary rotations, okay? It's a generalization of the classical. You need two qubit c naughts or exclusive OR gates. And then you put that, this is a little schematic here, you put that as a series of single qubit and two qubit gates, and you build that up, and then you can do an arbitrary logic. What people typically do, it's different than in, in classical circuits, is these, you have fixed qubits uh, that are uh, changing their operations uh, in time instead of in space. Okay, you put on control circuits, you play this music that controls them, and then you get, the, uh, get it. So you start with a known state, you do your time sequence, and then you measure it. Please note, classically, you can fan out your wiring because you can copy quantum information. Quantum mechanically, you can't copy information. So you have to, and, but it turns out that's okay. You can still do logic and operations. You just have to use more qubits and do a more complicated algorithm. Now, this kind of describes basic logic, but in fact, the world is even more complicated than that to make a, a, a full computer. In a classical system, what you typically do is have these memory elements and a clock system. So every rising edge of the clock pulse, you bring in an input signal. And then the outputs are fed back into the, like those add or digital circuits so that in time you do a sequence of operations and do that. And this self-timing makes the, uh, enables you to do very complex operations and pipeline and do interesting things. In a quantum system, remember, we had errors. And eventually, we want to do quantum error correction. And you can kind of think of the quantum error correction as this clock classical system. In the sense, as a normal error correction, you encode a logical state in many physical qubits. And then you repetitively run this error correction, which is basically parity measurements of all those things, so that every repetition you self-correct all the errors that's going on there. And then you measure that, and you feed it back, and you feed back gates to do all the logic so that you kind of have this clocked, uh, logically corrected uh, qubits going on versus time. The thing that I want to point out here is that we want, say, 10 to the minus 12 errors. We want small errors, just like in a classical computer. And the, the need for really, really tiny errors okay, means we need a lot of qubits, quantity, and quality, roughly about 0.1% errors, okay? So it's this quantity, this slow error rate that, that drives all this, okay? So let's be more quantitative about this. We need both quantity, number of qubits, and quality qubit error to do it. And I think it's very natural when you talk about that is just to have this two-dimensional plot. Okay, now, this is an important axis. I want you to remember this. Physicists will tell you their best error performance metrics. You know, they're proud of it. It's great, okay? When you build a real engineered system, it would be insane to design that around your best number. You always design it about your problem around the worst number. So please, when you see people talking about their system, find out what their worst qubit error is. And that's generically, it's not 100% true necessarily, but most of the time that will be the two qubit errors, okay? And, and how, how to get two qubits to interact together in this XOR kind of, kind of way. 
So that's what you want to plot here. So you just plot this, and you plot this. And I just told you for logical qubits, 10 to minus 12, we need 10 to minus 3. Okay? And this is about a factor below the error correction threshold. So I call this number here the error correction gain. And basically, the error has to be low enough so that we have enough gain that it'll keep correcting itself better and better as you make it bigger and bigger. If you're up here, you're dead. Okay? You mean about factor of 10 below? Obviously, the lower you go here, it's actually the fewer qubits that you need. So it shifts this curve to down here. At some point, it's only logarithmically helps you, but it, it, it's, it's significant. You want to do here. But I'm going to say this is what we're going to have to do. Okay, so we start here, and then, okay, we need more qubits. And then we build them up, and we do our quantum computer. Now, if we were in the era where it was trivial to make the worst qubit error 10 to minus 3, we would just be talking about number of qubits. But that's not where we are, and that's why it's absolutely insane to talk about as, as the only metric that we talk about publicly is the number of qubits. In fact, it, it depends on the system and whatever. But generally, I'm going to say we're up here at uh, maybe a 5%, a, a, a few percent, uh, whatever. Some, some systems not even talked about too much. We're up here. And we're talking about quantity. And of course, you know, everyone understands we're moving this way and we have to come down. But it's, it's absolutely um, silly to just be talking about quantity when we're up here, OK? And you know everyone's working on that. I understand that. But come on, that's where we are here. And we have to really fix this problem. And then quantity becomes important. But quantity is important, OK? Now, what we're doing at Google is that before I moved to Google, the reason why I moved to Google is we were able to get a nine qubit device below the error threshold here, which is better. And uh, we felt we could do better, and that we wanted to move down this as fast as possible, but still scale up enough so that we can show that we're doing something real, and then, of course, scale up. OK, so our strategy and you know we've been talking publicly about this. So this is, this is really what we're doing is to move down here. And what I'm going to talk about in a few minutes is a quantum supremacy device, 50 qubits, 10 to minus 3, 2 times 10 to minus 3 errors, that requires you to do both of these at the same time, scale up qubits and quality at the same time. And if we can get there, then, you know, OK, then it looks really interesting here. But this is all hard. I mean, I, you know, this is, we, we have to see if we can do it. Now. We're not quite here yet to do error corrected. It's going to take some time. We understand it's hard. We're talking right now about running some of these algorithms, unerror corrected algorithms. And we have a handful of qubits, you know, five to 50 qubits or so. And we're trying to do experiments at around 0.5%. And there's some other experiments around there that are doing a little bit worse. And you know you would expect that quality matters in this pre-error corrected regime, okay? And I just want to show some data to just emphasize how important quality is when you do that. And we're going to talk about quantum chemistry experiments. This is really a really nice thing. According to Feynman, mapping a quantum computer. Uh, uh, to a quantum chemistry is a very natural mapping, and you expect to get interesting results. This is something that looks really useful. We actually have a big program trying to do this. It looks so interesting. So um, let's just take, this is the simplest quantum chemistry thing you can think of, a hydrogen molecule. And blue is, uh, in black here is the exact. This is not a very hard calculation. In blue, we have a 200, 2015 Google experiment where we got 0.5%. And then more recently this year, there was a 5% error, uh, about 10 times worse error in red. OK? So in the blue, because of this accuracy, the difference in energy between here and here was good enough to achieve what's called chemical accuracy. 
And that's the error bars on that are small enough that you can predict root temperature reaction rates and do something useful for chemists. In this more recent experiment, which was uh, uh, building towards more qubits, and the way it was, it was, it was uh, worse uh, fidelity, it's in the red. And the accuracy of that is something like maybe 10 or 20 times worse, uh, which of course takes it out of the uh, chemical accuracy regime. And okay, it's maybe not expected, you know, you have worse uh, qubit fidelity and uh, uh, you get worse results. Okay, so quality does matter, okay? Um, this is a simple experiment, one qubit in this uh, 2017. They did a more complicated lithium hydride molecule with more qubits. It's a much more harder experiment. It's very interesting because of that. Again, the black is exact. The blue is the energy of the initial product state, so it's a trivial state that you can com compute uh, very easily, and red is the result out of the quantum computer. Okay? Now, I want to point out something here. When you take the initial trial, and then you run your quantum computer, is, is the data getting better? I mean, is the quantum computer helping you compute anything here? I, I'm, you know, maybe it is, but not very much, okay? So what does that mean, okay? If you run your quantum computer and your results aren't all that much better, okay? And I want to point out that the thing is like here, the main thing is we need good qubits in order to actually get some information that's useful. It's nice to do a demonstration experiment and show you can run an algorithm, but you know, you're, you're hoping to get chemical accuracy or close to that, okay? I also want to point out that when you do this, this okay, need, you need, when you do these, quote, useful calculations and trying to see this, you need to have good figures of merit to know whether your actually quantum computer is doing something giving you better results, okay? It's complicated, okay? We have to get better at doing this, okay? Now I'm gonna talk about quantum supremacy, and the basic idea here is to show this pow power of the quantum computer, okay? And uh, just a, a brief, uh, briefer uh, statement of this, for a well-defined problem, show there's more computation power for a quantum computer. Okay, it's a simple idea. I want to give cautions about this. This is a really great idea. We're, we're, we're doing this, this is great. F cautions, how do you know whatever you're solving is a hard problem? And for example, and this is, goes back to the quantity issue, you make a 50 qubit quantum processor or something, and you run an algorithm, how do you know that that algorithm, whatever he did, was computationally co complex? You don't know that a priori. Just running a bunch of qubits and making a bunch of qubits and running an algorithm is not really telling you how complex the system is. That's actually a, it's actually a difficult problem to do that. And I'm going to say, as we've kind of looked at what people are doing, and some, at least for one example we see here, if you run something, for example, with 50 qubits, with a simple answer and without the need of good control, this is kind of in the realm of quantum simulation, we think it's, this problem is likely going to be solved by some kind of short either computation or calculation. It's not complex enough to really fit within this, this thing. So, I, I, it's, it's a complicated issue. I think it's great with our discussion. I just want people to be, be wary that you have to be very careful about uh, you know, what, what this is. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of tricky. Now, what we're doing at Google is trying to circumvent this kind of thing by running another kind of quantum supremacy algorithm. And I'm going to say this is a harder quantum supremacy algorithm. So if something is supreme, then how do you talk about doing something better than supreme? So, you know, I don't know if the name is, is the best thing. So I'm just going to call it quantum supremacy plus plus, okay? So what we explicitly want to do is build an algorithm. You demonstrate the exponentially growing computational space explicitly. 
Okay, part of the algorithm is really looking at that. And of course, testing that and, and showing, showing that. And that's where the power of it comes from. Doing something hard, and hard in this case, we know it's hard. It's a totally unstructured problem. There's no trick. We're going to randomly choose them. And we just start it, randomly choose, from randomly chosen gets, we measure the outputs, uh, let's say, 100,000 times. And if there are 50 uh, qubits, there are uh, you know, trillions and trillions of possible output states. Okay? And uh, uh, what we're going to do is look at the outputs of that. Now, to kind of give an idea of, of what's happening here, I'm going to use an analogy now with the laser. And the laser is going to represent a coherent source of qubits, and then I have a, uh, a ground glass on top of it that represents this random circuit. Okay, so when you have a laser going through a ground glass, what you're going to see is um, uh, uh, this green light pattern here, and it's going to be spread out from the ground glass. But um, is it better over here? I'll go shoo it over here too, a little bit better. And you're going to see this spread out green, but what you're going to see is that there's speckle here. Some directions are brighter light, and some direction is weaker light. And this is actually what's happening going out here. This is an analogy. We're seeing qubit speckle. And all you, although you expect randomly that all these states here are kind of equally probable, what you find is because of the interference in this random circuit, some states are brighter some states are more probable and some states are less probable. It's a property of a quantum system, of this wave amplitude interference. And what, me, what that happens is we're basically going to measure the brightest states because they have the, uh, the best probability, the biggest probability, and then we're going to check if the, uh, the states we measure, which are the most probable, are the highest probability states that you calculate for the system. And the way you do that is you take this known random circuit, calculate what the evolution of the probability should be, and this will have low and high probabilities. And then we're going to measure this cross entropy so that for the states we measure, we're going to uh, look up what the probability is. And because those are probabilities are higher than the classical probabilities, the cross entropy will be higher if things work. And if you're in the quantum limit, it's this number turns out to be here. If it's totally random, it's this, this is difference by one, and you can tell whether the, the system is working properly. Okay, so that's the basic idea. So the speckle tells you if there's coherence, and if we can predict things, it's actually going to tell us about how good our system is working. The quality, not just the, the individual qubits and gates, but the quality of the system as a whole, which is, of course, something we want to know to see if everything's working right. Okay? So this, uh, what happens with errors? Okay, you know, you know errors kill it. Okay, and errors in this algorithm kill the algorithm. And what you can do is you can say this total energy is an average between the quantum and classical with a probability of no error, which is basically the number of gates times the error per gate. So it's the total number of errors, okay? And this, uh, uh, this can be computed, uh, just order of magnitude, you take 49 qubits and a square array, you're going to have to do at least seven depth to entangle all those qubits. So it's about 350 uh, operations take 0.5%, which we already have done, okay? So that's a number that's not unreasonable. And this number is of order unity, okay? So it says that we're kind of in the same region. When you do it more accurately and do the full thing, this number is more like 0.002, but okay, you get the idea of how it does. And what's great about this is you need both quantity and quality to do that, okay? And that's why... As a manager, I chose this experiment because it forces everyone in my group to do both of these things at the same time. Okay. So here's the, so 
That's 50 qubits. I want to show you data on a 9 qubit device just to show you that the ideas work. OK? So here's 9 qubits. This island and the ground plane forms a capacitor. The Josephson junctions is an inductor. That's a nonlinear LC oscillator. That's the, uh, that's the qubit. We have a little, these currents here flow here in mutual inductances. And with another Joseph's injunction, we can change the coupling between these. Here's the control lines, qubits. The readout is done here by sending in microwaves and reflecting them on. OK? Here's the results of a nine qubit device where we put two photons in to our device, two excitations, and the interactions of all this spreads those out. And for five qubits, there's 10 possible states here. For one particular instance, you see this probability distribution. And note that there's some low, lots of low, and some high. And this is the speckle pattern I was showing you with the laser, OK? And you see that here. You do another instance, it's a different speckle pattern. OK, another instance, a different speckle pattern, et cetera. So you see that there's coherence just from looking at these raw probability histograms. To be a little bit more quantitative, we just histogram the probabilities through here in all the different instances. And we normalize them by the number of states, which is growing exponentially in this particular case. And this all collapses onto an exponential distribution that you expect for speckle. OK, there's a little bit error here. And that you can understand by doing an experiment, of, except for five cycles, you do it for 100 cycles, where you're losing all your coherence after 100 cycles. And then the uni and it's a uniform distribution around the mean probability, and that's just white light. OK, that's just the uniform light. OK, so that's what you expect. So that's working properly. You can also take this, and we know what gates we put in. We can predict what it should be, just the integration of the Schrodinger equation. And that's the red dots here. And you see extremely good, you know, where Probabilities are high, the prediction's high, where the probability low, the prediction is low, and that happens for all the different patterns. Okay, speckle pattern matches the theory. And you can compare that, see how good it is. And this is the cross entropy. For now, we've normalized it so that zero is a random guess and one is a perfect prediction. And uh, we get good fidelities in the 90% for a few qubits and going down a little bit more for nine qubits. And you see here, this is what you expect. As you do more operations, there's a bigger chance of error. So the fidelity goes down. If you do more qubits, there's more chance to make an error and the fidelity goes down. And it more or less scales in that way. And uh, you can see that this is, a, when you work this all out, it's about 0.3% error per gate and per cycle. So, you know, it's, it's, we're doing really well. We can do a really good, accurate uh, simulation, accurate control of our system, which is, of course, what you need to do. Just to be fun, let's just scale up from 3 to 90. You just take these slopes and you multiply them by the right factor at 45 qubits. You know, couple number of cycles, uh, you know, we should be able to have a non zero value here and do it. So, uh, you know, we, we have a, there's a lot to do here. Okay, this is not easy to scale it up and get all that right, but you can see that eh, this is something that's possible, okay, in the future, we think. Also, want to point out uh, these kind of metrology experiments, uh, checking it out, is really useful for making an accurate control system. There's, um, some of our parameters are very stable. Some are just the flux drift around a little bit. And what we did here is use the quantum uh, supremacy experiment to start with some uh, uh, error in our, in our qubit fidelity around 0.2%. And then we basically ran Nelder Mead to tune up those flux offsets. And again, this is not much work for us to do. You just run a program. And then over time, it finds a little bit better values and eventually gets to a, an error that's significantly lower in here. And you can do this both in a training and verification data set to really prove that you're improving the system performance. So the training is verified. 
So this is very useful for making accurate systems. So we, we think that this is going to be part of our whole calibration system uh, and, and testing system uh, in the future. This, this, is, this is useful. I also, before I wanted to get to the conclusion part, talk a little bit about demonstrating some kind of, let's say, quantum materials application. Okay, And uh, this particular, this is using that nine qubit device. That nine qubit device can be used to simulate the physics of a 2D grid of, uh, of atoms. In this particular case, think of this as a, a graphing sheet, okay? And what we want to know is the energies of this, or the tones of this, if you like, versus an applied magnetic field. So it's the kind of thing that uh, typically people would want to do. Okay, now here's the Hamiltonian. It's more you just uh, assume uh, constant uh, coupling between all the sites, but then the magnetic fields puts a, a shift in the, in the energy of each of the individual sites according to this cosine uh, behavior here. So this is not too complex of a, a problem, but the answer it gives is actually quite interesting in terms of the energy versus the magnetic field. Uh, and what you see is that there's these bands where there's no energy eigenstates. Uh, and this kind of structure here is called the Hofstadter butter butterfly, first observed by Hofstadter, in fact, in the 60s. And you see it's a very, very complex behavior here with these bands coming in here. Now, we want to do an experiment on this, say, but this is actually kind of hard because for you to put one flux quantum in here to make B equal 1, to see this full structure, requires about 10,000 Tesla to put in each of these atomic sites. And, uh, you know, we can't do that. So obviously, simulation is great. So it's a motivation to do that with this. So what we do is we map that into our system. And again, it's only nine qubits, so not as many states as what we can do. But when you look at this energy spectrum versus magnetic field, you again see these kind of avoided regions here and here and a little bit in here that is exactly like the Hofstadter butterfly. And I would say what's even more interesting here is you can see the complex fractal nature of these energy eigenstates as they go through here. And if you look at these things, this is really kind of, kind of complicated behavior with magnetic field where this goes up and down in some very complicated way. There's all this structure here. Again, it's fractal. There's not any kind of structure you're going to look at that. Okay, so we're going to try to simulate this. And what we do is we calibrate our system very, very carefully. Okay, it took about a year to figure out how to calibrate this system super carefully. And then we do the supremacy experiment to check that it's working okay. And then you just program in this problem, okay? As this is the fair use of a quantum computer. So do you expect just by running it to get the results, all this structure, and the dots of the results, just by running it, as you, as you would want to do with a quantum computer? And you see, whereas this is going up and down, the experiments going, data is going up and down in a good way, and you see all the kind of structure in all the complicated areas here are really very well uh, understood. And in fact, we've color-coded these dots so that the typical error is a few to five megahertz. And this is on an energy scale of hundreds of megahertz. Okay, so you have a percent, a few percent uncertainty in your data. And the point I want to make here is that we can actually build these systems and control them and calibrate them well enough that you can extract complex and physically useful information, okay? It's not hard yet. It's still a little bit of a toy problem, but it's not, you know, this is complex enough that you see that, you know, it's kind of typical in, in the kind of thing you would see. So we're really excited that, you know, there are possibilities of doing some nice uh, materials or, or chemistry physics as we move forward with these devices. Okay, so I'm coming to the conclusion now, and I've been emphasizing quality, okay? 
Of course, quantity is important and quality. It's a system. There's a lot of things that matter, okay? And that's just, I'm going to just mention a few of them, okay? People need to know about this. They're asking questions about the different systems. Quantities, all of the quality, uh, two qubit errors, measurement errors, one qubit errors are important. This is the hardest one generally, but these other ones are important. Be careful because most of the time people tell you about this, and that's actually the easiest thing to get right. And that's fundamental reasons for that. So, so you have to really think about this. What I haven't talked about are other things like device speed, okay? From the different devices people are talking about and building system, there are speed differences that are not, you know, trivial and you can ignore. It could be up to 100,000. Okay, now we understand you build a quantum device, just getting an answer with this exponential states is important. But speed, if it were a factor of three or 10, I wouldn't care. But you know, at 100,000, you, you need to know about that. And you know, again, it, it, things can be useful. You just need to know about this. This effect actually affects the calibration. And I'm gonna also say, let's say you want to have this as a user facility. And these machines cost about a million dollars, roughly. If you have a slow device, that's about a million dollars per useful, per user. If you have a fast device that's 100,000 times faster, it's about $10 per user to use a quantum computer, because it's faster. You know, we all know speed matters. So it's not talked about much in quantum computing, but it really is important to some degree. Okay, it's, it's a little subtle it's to some degree. Finally, um, talk about qubit connectivity. Okay, we have to build these arbitrary circuits and connectivity is important, that's for sure. And that's something you know, that's important to discuss. What I would say is if you wanna do the whole error correction and logic, actually a 2D array works with something called the surface code and it's pretty efficient code, pretty, works pretty well, so you can get along with it. But you know, clearly, it can, better connectivity allows you to do more things. And I'm also going to say, if you have a lot of connectivity and it's serial versus a parallel kind of connectivity, the serial is going to make it slower. So it's complicated. I mean, you know, I, I'm not going to review everything here, but, you know, just be aware of that. Okay. So what are our Google hardware plans? Okay. We've had... In the, in the past, nine cube devices, gate base, and kind of a continuous base. We're building a NeoWars 2. Our two qubit fidelity is about 0.5%, sometimes a little bit worse. And these are about 20 nanosecond, and these are about 40 nanosecond gates. So they work pretty well, okay? We need to make them better, but they work pretty well. And you know, in terms of system performance, you know, that, that's, that's pretty good right now, okay? Um, we're moving up in quantity. We have a 22 qubit device in test. It's a 2 by 11 array. Um, we're still working on tests, so I don't have any official numbers for you yet. But I'm going to say be basically the performance is similar to the 9 qubit device. Nothing horrible went wrong. And in fact, by doing the fabrication, we have better crosstalk and better control. And, you know, we, we, we think we're, we're doing okay here. And then as we're doing this, we're working even more on quantity for a quantum supremacy device and fabrication. And our, our name for that is bristlecone. And you see this nice little checkered board arrangement in the bristlecone, and that is indicating that it's a square array, which is, of course, what you want to build for doing all this. So it's in fabrication right now, both in our foundry and uh, in, in UCSB. And we hope to be testing it in about two weeks and, uh, you know, barring Christmas vacations, et cetera. Uh, and uh, what we're doing is we're hoping to put that out in a Google uh, Quantum Cloud offering once we get this work. We might start with this device, but this device is going to be better, so we're, we're still working on that. So, uh, um, and, you know, uh, the idea here is we're really working on quality because if you have a device, you know, nine qubits, you, you can run a classical computer calculation to do that. We're trying to give you quality, and we're trying to give you enough qubits that it's really interesting from the computational point of view. 
So that's going forward, and we hope to offer that soon. And what I would say in terms of quantity, the whole path here, we've been working on this three years, to try to find a path or a technology path that's scalable way beyond the supremacy device. And our target path here, to just brute force scale to something like 1,000 or you know, a little bit more qubits. So that's what we're trying to do. I mean, we'll have to see if we can get that work. But that basic technology set seems possible for this. And then, of course, we have to go beyond that. But that's too much speculation about that there. OK? Um, I want to just kind of uh, uh, end this, again, with an emphasis. What was this talk about? This talk was about how quality is so important. Okay, And I'm going to say, for example, I think in yesterday there was a talk and some discussions about all the technologies around here. And I believe that table listed the different efforts, but the number of qubits, which is fine. But I really am trying to emphasize in the future, when we make these tables, go to technical presentations, talk to users about it, we need to be talking about quality also, because quality matters. Okay, almost maybe more than quantity. Okay? So we'll see if that happens. I, people nod their head, and then they go off and talk, and they never talk about quality. It's OK. But we got your back. We're working on it. I understand it's hard, OK? But what I want is for the users here, to, if you want to be a pro user and really understand what's going on, so these are the three questions you want to ask about a system to know where it is, OK? It's quantity and quality, of course. Make sure that when you're talking about quality, you're talking about the worst system error, not the best, OK? Because you know, we're building a real engineered system. Generically, that's two qubit, OK? And also, you have to be aware that the quality can be a function of quantity. So if someone has a nice quality measure on two qubits, that's interesting. But what you really want to know is what happens when you go to 5 and 10 and 20 and 50, what happens to the, to the quality. Okay, That's the real measure, because these things are competing against each other. So my hope is you know, people can start seriously uh, dealing with this. And you know, the experimenters are working on this. But as a user community, I just want to educate you that this is important for you to understand if you're going to be able to predict what's going on. But you know, given we have to do all that, I'm actually very optimistic that uh, you know, we're working on it. We'll be able to solve these problems. And it's going to have a really interesting future for all of us in building this hardware. So thank you very much. Could we, um, yeah. thank you very much. Yeah, Could we take two questions, please? Um, we are really short on time, but yeah. go ahead, John, you can follow. All right. You mentioned that uh, flux biases drift, and you need to tune them up. So you, how often do you need to tune them up? During the operation or? So um, what happens is for our devices, we typically tune them up once a day. And that kind of, uh, uh, you know, you can do it more efficiently than Nelder Mead. But uh, it's actually pretty fast to tune up those kind of things. You, you generally want to tune up other things and maybe takes a half hour. But what we find is if we do it once a day, it's generally good. That's for our qubits. I'm not going to say what other qubits or what other superconducting qubits do. But it's actually something we want to take more careful measurements on. But it's not horrible. However, if you're running a very long quantum computer calculation, we've actually done some work to show that you can do some tune-up in the middle of an error correction. So you can be doing this over time. It is possible to do that. It's pretty complicated, but you know, we're not going to do that now, but it is possible. So it's not bad. You can deal with it. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about for our 9 and 22 qubit device, you can tune up all this stuff, no problem. It's, it's really, we have to do it, but it's not a huge problem.
I mean, you know, all experiments drift. I mean, it's just a question of how often you have to do it. Another question, please? <laughs> no one else will have another. Oh, there's one, there's one over there. Yes. Go ahead. S sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So f very often people talk about coherence time as some metric. And that's really kind of a crappy metric because you need to know what your gate time is. Because it's the gate time divided by the coherence time that tells you how good it is. So, you know, I understand, you know, I, you know, I pay attention, I, I do that. But that's not the best metric. And furthermore, that ratio tends to tell you a single qubit error rate and, you know, not necessarily what happens when you couple them together because that's way more complicated. So um, those are good metrics. People should know about it, but be careful about that. And what I say is the two qubit error rate, I believe, is the, is the best. If you want to just hold on to a couple ideas, I think that's the best, best metric, okay? Quick question, please. Okay, yes. Um, uh, you know, I wrote a paper. Uh, it's on my website at UCSB about the metrics and, and kind of what we, they should be. So uh, there, you know, I, I have a list of it, and you know, I, I could talk to you personally uh, later on, on on what's going on there. But uh, yeah, there there is. We have some discussion on what this should be. Um, in the end, I think a really good metric will be something like the quantum supremacy experiment, because it gives you a global system metric of how everything is working together. So uh, if we get that, as we get that experiment to work better then, uh, you know, I think that's something that we're going to be doing. I, I, you know, I, I, part of what I'm trying to do is I'm, people, I understand the need for simple metrics and doing that. This is a really complicated system. This is as far away uh, from, uh, you know, from a, uh, a commodity item that you can think of, right? Okay, this is really hard, okay? And, you know, commodity items, maybe you talk about quantity, Okay, but this, this is far away. So I, I'm really hesitant to do that because the different approaches might have different metrics and that might be unfair to people. So, I, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm trying to simplify it as much as I can. Thank you. Thank you.